Hi, I'm Julia Flanders. I direct the Women Writers Project at the Brown University Center for Digital Scholarship. So what does scholarly communication mean to me? I think it means both a set of traditional genres that we all recognize, books, articles in journals, conference proceedings, papers, that kind of intervention. But I think it also has to mean now the kinds of collaborative and informal and interstitial interventions that include things like blog postings, comments on other people's blog postings, uh, the kinds of interaction that we see on discussion lists, uh, and also things like comments on digital resources, uh, other kinds of interventions that are relating to or interacting with some already recognized genre of scholarly communication. I guess we should also include things like peer review comments as well. In other words, I see scholarly communication as really being an ecology that circles around moving our ideas about scholarship forward. I think my definition affects the choice of projects that I take on, um, but only indirectly because my project is funded by grants, and so I have, to, I have to go where the money is. I have to go where the work is. Um, so primarily, at the moment, I'm involved in the Women Writers Project at Brown, which publishes an online collection of women's writing, and uh, it publishes it in digital form as a big TEI XML collection. And associated with that collection are various kinds of scholarly communication that are uh, both formal, in the sense of you know, formal scholarly articles that are commenting on the collection, um, but also potentially um, materials contributed by readers that may uh, add to the collection or contextualize the collection. For example, uh, information about how a text was received or a comment that elucidates um, something that's described in one of the texts or a biographical essay about one of the authors. I think I see the Women Writers Project's uh, d digital publications as being increasingly a sort of, again, an ecology of uh, information and responses to information um, that together form a sort of network of information where it's hard to isolate one part or another part and say, that is the scholarly communication. I also edit the um, journal Digital Humanities Quarterly, which is an online open access peer reviewed journal of digital humanities. And DHQ is another angle on scholarly communication, which I find very interesting because it is both traditional, it's a, it's a journal with the apparatus of peer review and all the rest of it, but it's also an experiment in how the ways that we model information, the ways that we model our scholarly communication can give those communications another life in a different realm. So in addition to publishing these articles for humans to read, we also are constituting them as a kind of corpus of the historiography of digital humanities. And because these articles are published in XML using the TEI guidelines, there's a lot of information embedded in the article content which can be later used for analysis of uh, rhetorical patterns or citation patterns, you know, who is reading whom, who responds to whom. Um, the, whole, the whole landscape of digital humanities, uh, the part of it that Digital Humanities Quarterly covers, um, could be exposed for later research. And I think that that's a very interesting way of coming at scholarly communication because it uh, creates a longer tail of use and also a more various kind of, uh, of use later on. I also am working at the moment on a project um, called the TEI Archiving Publication and Access Service, TAPAS, which is going to provide uh, an infrastructure for scholarly communication of a very particular kind. The TAPAS service is intended to help scholars who have created TEI encoded data who don't necessarily have access to resources at their own institution to publish this data. Um, they don't necessarily have programmers. They don't necessarily have the ability to design a project interface for it. And they need a way of making this data accessible and usable by their audience. What the TAPAS service will do is provide repository services and publication services for scholars um, and enable them to contribute their TEI data to this repository 
and build publication interfaces uh, that draw data from the repository. And I think that one interesting aspect of this from the point of view of scholarly communication is to see how these originally separate publications may come together under the TAPAS rubric to form a larger collective publication that may be used in ways that the individual contributors haven't foreseen. One of the questions I was asked to address is whether I see a distinct line between digital collection management and scholarly communication activities and programming. And I would say I don't see a distinct line between those two, but I come at the question from the point of view of the digital humanities, where the creators and publishers of information and of digital collections um, work in an ecology where the management of that data and the curation of that data and the subsequent reconsumption of that data and repurposing of that data is really one tightly integrated um, ecology. Um, so from my point of view, those distinctions are harder to draw. However, I suspect from the perspective of someone who has to define certain roles, certain kinds of workflows for digital collections management, those distinctions may actually still be quite useful. So I've also been asked to comment on how I think the open access movement is affecting scholarly communication. And I think one of the important effects is that we're being forced to think more knowledgeably and more carefully about how we fund scholarly communication and also about what aspects of scholarly communication really produce the visible costs of publication. Um, for example, the work of peer review, the work of formalizing and productizing uh, scholarly communication into its recognizable objects like books and journal articles and conference proceedings. I'm very aware of these issues as the editor of an online journal because uh, readers and authors in this journal imagine that because the journal is online and because it's open access that somehow the work of producing it will be radically diminished. And of course that's not true. There's a tremendous amount of work involved not only in uh, working with the authors to bring the article to fruition, but also creating the article as an intellectual object, complete with its encoding, its metadata, you know, all of its apparatus of correctness and citability. So I think that when we think from the point of view of open access, we are asked to think in much more detail about those costs and about who should support them. Without the uh, funding from the Alliance of Digital Humanities Organizations, Digital Humanities Quarterly couldn't exist. And I think there are a lot of digital publications, open access publications, that are in a similar situation. My personal feeling, though, is that we also need to think beyond open access, which still, I think, as a, as a program, as an agenda, leaves untouched a lot of the traditional aspects of scholarly communication, such as peer review and our sense of what the powerful genres are, the book, the journal article, um, the conference. Um, and I think we need to consider modes of scholarly communication that are more radically different even than the digital modes of these traditional forms. We need to be thinking about scholarly communication in ways that are more interpersonal, more interstitial, more responsive, less institutionalized, and ultimately more focused on the communicative aspects of scholarly communication. The, the fact that we are communicating about something we care about and the fact that there is a broad range of participants in this communication not limited to the nominal producer of the knowledge or the nominal audience for the knowledge, but also those who may comment or add or ramify it or disagree or debate about it. And I think all of those aspects of scholarly communication need to be taken seriously and need to be accommodated. Uh, and it will help very much if we can turn our attention away from these sort of boutique products and more towards an ecological view, which may take into account open access, but also linked data and also forms of dissemination and curation which involve using data in ways that it was not originally designed to be used. So how does this definition drive the kinds of activities that I participate in? I think my job involves activities that look like traditional scholarly communication. I contribute articles to books, I contribute articles to journals, I publish 
a digital journal myself as, as the editor. I also direct a conventional digital humanities research project, the Women Writers Project. But I think in all of these kinds of projects, I'm interested in the ways that they also function in the periphery, in their own periphery. I'm interested in the ways that digital publication and digital scholarly communication invite intervention, not just in the form of comment and annotation, although that's very important as well, but also in the form of enhancement, reuse, recuration, and ultimately complete reformulation along different lines. I'm very interested in the ways that digital publications will be protean ectoplasm that will then be taken up by future generations and turned into things we can't even imagine. And so any scholarly communication activity I'm involved in makes me wonder how it will be used in the future. And I think that for that reason, I try to choose projects which emphasize reusable data, data that is standards-based, uh, data that has a long view of its own usefulness, data that is not focused on some particular task. Um, and I also like to think about interfaces that don't lay too proprietary a stamp on that data, but rather uh, expose it for other people to work with. So for instance, um, the Digital Humanities Quarterly Journal has an XML interface through which third parties can take that XML data and expose it through a different through a different view. And the Women Writers Project similarly, uh, in its next release, will be exposing much of its data for third party use. And I think that this is a very important aspect of, of scholarly communication in the digital age, not to over-determine what the scholarly communication is, but instead to open it out so that it proliferates and connects with other things and can have a sort of uh, flexible, powerful life uh, in its own future.